Hi, Chicken Bone John here. Welcome to another episode of Making a Cigar Box Guitar. In this session, we're going to be installing some frets into our fretboard, which is all glued on and slotted, position dot marked, and so forth. It may be a little bit daunting, but it is perhaps the most important part of making a fretter guitar, getting these frets in. So let's get to it. Right, we're going to put some frets in here. The first thing we're going to do is to make sure that this is flat and not twisted, not bowed one way or the other. Because we've got no truss rod in here, we can't make any adjustments afterwards. So ideally this needs to be truly flat or possibly with just a little bit of bow this way, a little bit of relief, but we're only talking you know, fractions, fractions of a millimetre. So, what that does, it helps the vibration of the string clear the frets. But I find that if you make this nice and flat, a little bit of tension on the neck would pull that tiny bit of relief in for you. That's the way we always do it, never really have any problems with it. So, the first thing we can do is simply sight down the neck and if you look down the neck offer this up to your eye and look down from this viewpoint you should be able to see whether this is a decent straight line or not and also if there's any twist now that's the first thing you do which will give you a clue as to whether it's okay this one looks like it's got a little bit of bow in it so what I do take the ruler and I can actually see it's sort of spanning between here and here. So that's sort of acceptable, but I'm going to get that bang on flat because what, I'd, what, I'd, what I'll be doing is sighting. You probably won't see on this, but we'll be sighting to see if there's a gap here. So that's the first test. The other thing which we want to do is to check not only is it straight that way, but is it twisted? It, this and this need to be in the same plane. As I said, we can sight down it, but here's something we can do to double check that. What I've got here are what we call winding sticks, because twist in a piece of wood is called wind. That's the old sort of uh, term for it. You still get that term in joinery. Uh, you know, winding stairs, which are, you know, curved stairs on a spiral staircase or whatever. So we've just got two pieces of wood, which we know are bang on straight and parallel. And on this, on one edge, we've got a black line, and on the other, we've got a couple of white inlaid dots, a piece of plastic, so that when you look down these, the whole idea is... We, you get the you put these on the neck, and if it's slightly out, you'll be able to see this registering against that. That dot is just for balance to put it in the middle. So what we we'll, what we can do is put one there and one there, and if we look down here, we can see if that's parallel. Okay, so here we've got the neck set up with the two winding sticks. On here and if we lower our viewpoint we should be able to see there you go if I move that up and down that that's pretty well true there's no twist in that which is good news that, okay you know if there were any if, if part of this was higher you could see you know this might be twisted like that and you would really register that there's something wrong with it. but we. So there you go, very easy to make, just two bits of wood, you don't need these fancy marks, but I've just put that on because it makes them a little bit easier to use. That's a couple of pieces of the cherry, a bit of off-cut plastic, a couple of position dots to mark the centre. There you go. What we're going to do is sand this flat. A couple of important things, when I talked about sanding the back of the, shaping the, carving and sanding the back of the neck, I'm saying it can um, take a little bit of stress out of parts of the wood and it can make it move. 
So in all of this process, it's very important we don't put this neck under any stress. So what I'm going to do, I've got a piece of scrap wood here, which is the same thickness as the heel. So we're going to put that on there. And now I've got that neck fully supported and I can clamp that down. Okay. I have actually got a jig which I use for this. It's a little bit fancy. You can see it's just a piece of plywood and it's got a piece in the bottom here which is going to support the neck along its length. That's the important thing. That's just going to drop in there. That's nice and snug and then I can clamp that down. So for working on here that's all sort of nice and firmly held. Actually, we do that. I use that for putting driving frets in for sanding. I wouldn't hold that down. Okay, so we're going to be clamping this down. So we put a piece of wood under here, which is going to support the neck across its length, along its length. Sorry. I'm just going to clamp this down with the speed clamps. I say it's very important that you don't that you're not bending this neck. So that that spacer needs to be the same thickness as your heel back strap. So as to not induce any curve on this at all. If you pull any curve into this and then release it, it's going to go all over the place. Now to level it, we're going to use this, which is a leveling beam. This is a piece of aluminium. 400 mil long and I've double stick tape, double sided taped uh, some sandpaper. I've got a 120 grit on this side and a 240 grit on that side and I'm going to level this. Now before I start doing that I'm just going to put some pencil marks through this. I think we've done this before. As I say some people call them witness marks I don't think they are properly called witness marks. But if we put some pencil marks through there, we'll be able to check our progress. So I'm going to start with a coarse sandpaper and just go gently, keep going. See I'm moving from one side to another and indeed I'll go diagonally. Just to make sure. If there's any twist, now you can, I can see here there's some marks here. This hasn't been touched yet, so little low spot here, these are a bit high, and I could sight it and see that these ends were a little bit high. I'm not pressing very hard, I'm just letting the abrasive do its work. It's one thing that you will need to do, renew this, don't expect it to last that long because it will clog up. I'll just take a brush so we can see what we're doing here. I can still see, I'm not sure if it's picked up on the camera, but I can still see I've got some pencil marks here. So I'm going to keep going again diagonally from, I'm going to go from corner to corner, then turn around and go from corner to corner to make sure if there is any twist, and there wasn't, but I make sure I'm not, I'm not sanding in any twist. You know you could you could be heavy on one side and then heavy on the other side and do some and then be down on one side. If you make sure you go parallel, I'm just using my thumbs down the edge of the neck to keep that in place. Keep working, keep checking. I'm just gonna brush that off. I can still see some marks so I'm not quite happy with that. Pressing down a bit firmer. Then I'm going to go diagonal. Diagonal the other way. Back to that parallel, uh, working parallel with the neck. And then just brush that off to see how we go. I've still got a little dip here. So I'm going to keep going. And the thing is, although the, the dip is just here, the trick is not just to keep working that side, you need to work across the whole width of the board. 
So to get that down, we need all the board down, including this. That's the last bit you want to hit. So it's important that you keep moving backwards and forwards across the width of your board, because this doesn't span the full width of your board. For something like this, it really isn't appropriate to be planing this because we've got slots cut in it, we've got inlays and a plane would just rip this to shreds. I've got one little bit left here, so I'm going to keep going. Keep going with that parallel, rotating it round, doing the other parallel, coming, uh, other diagonal, coming back. Making sure I'm parallel now. And of course it's with the grain as well. So I think but a tiny bit left here. Another few passes. Now take that out. If we're about right. Just about there, there's a faintest pencil line there, right at the end, right at the edge of the board. It does require a little bit of patience, and there's no real way to rush this. You try doing this on the belt sander, and you will not get it flat, because the bed of a belt sander probably won't be long enough to cover that, and it's just a piece of pressed steel. So unless you hand lap it, and get it perfectly flat but you know your belt sander's got a belt with a join in it um, there's a lot of movement in that belt it's not an appropriate way to level a fretboard I'm afraid doing it by hand is the way to go we've got that out pretty much I think there's just a no oh no that's actually a bit of grain I think but just for a bit of look I'll go over that and keep working parallel and diagonal and I'm going to flip this over and start bringing that to a, down to a finer degree of sanding so I'm going to go from my 120 to my 240 now I don't want to be taking I really don't want to be taking anything off with this I'm just getting the grain polished out now I am not going to take off this sharp edge, I think I might just do one, two, three very light passes so there's no splinters developing. Now see what we're doing? We're now going to be taking out more and more of those grooves. By the way this is a piece of Blackwood Tech which is actually New Zealand pine that's dyed, compressed, uh, pressure and heat treated it ends up very very much like rosewood it's a little bit more br brittle it can splinter on you so you need to be very careful but if you're using something like a piece of uh, sapili or uh, walnut they're much softer and a bit more forgiving to work with uh, maple is nice but it will discolour very easily you need to work very cleanly with that you know, if you're doing inlays in it it will show if you've got any glue splodges or whatever that you know use your hands to feel whether that's coming up okay. that will probably be acceptable for most people but we're going to use these to get a little bit more uh, polish on the uh, on, on this neck these are micro mesh pads abrasive pads they're rather expensive but they're pretty good so they start with a very fine grit I mean this is an 1800 they're like on a dense foam backing but if you use this and you can wash these you can wash the dust out of them so they will last you quite a long time. You can actually, I don't know if it's picked up on the camera here, it's beginning to bring out some of this grain, which is quite nice. But when we oil that up, that will go really nice and dark. 
and it also polishes up your inlays from that 120 uh, sorry the uh, 240 so we're already going quite fine in here with an 1800 which is probably as much as you want to do if you don't have this you know you can get some 1000 1800 2000 grit uh, emery or something like that do be careful with stuff like emery paper the black stuff because it can get into the grain of the timber and if you're using something like maple or oak a light colour oak especially because it's very open poured you might get quite a lot of that sandy debris off the uh, off the paper in there in a nasty sort of black dust so that's gone to an 1800 and that's that's feeling pretty good I'll jump up a few uh, a few notches this is a 4000 which is I can feel that is I should have gone through a few stages really but that is almost burnishing that and here it's actually beginning to squeak so that's a really finely polished piece of wood now it's going to be really smooth under your fingers to play that we could go as high I mean these go as high as 12,000 which is crazy so for, for that I'll say it's about 4,000 grit that's probably twice as high as anything you'd normally get with a piece of emery paper but as I say these things are really handy they are expensive they're probably about 15 18 pounds for a pack with all these different grades in uh, but if you take care of them rinse them out occasionally they will last you a fair drop of time so we've got our neck checked if twist checked it for level we'll just dust this out get rid of some of this stuff you can blow this out of these slots but I don't think it's very good for your health so I'm just going to dust this out if there's anything left in there you can tap it or use a scalpel so I'm going to take my clamps off and that shouldn't really do anything because we should have that should have all been clamped nicely flat I'm going to check again I can feel it now I've got a tiny tiny bit of give in the middle the most fractional give and if I if I sight I don't think you'll be able to see any gap through there if it doesn't work the first time repeat the process so I'm just going to tap off that and I can still see I've got some dust in there so I'm just going to get a scalpel and clean those slots out so I'm just going to take a scalpel and just run it down there there's quite a lot of dust in there that sort of got compacted by the sanding So we just go along the fretboard because you don't want this compacting at the bottom of these slots as you try to drive your fret wire in. Okay. Tap that off. Right now we are ready to put some frets in. <coughs> and as I say we'll probably put them in we'll probably put them in in this jig here it just keeps it nice and still and it's a bit quicker but you don't need to do that but if you want to make one it's just made out of scrap timber and a couple of these cheap clamps so once again we're gonna clamp this down nice and firm we don't want this to be moving while we're trying to fret so here we are ready to start fretting we don't need many tools we've got 
a good pair of side cutters, or end cutters, sorry. A hammer with nylon faces. You want something with it's got nylon or brass or copper faces. This is uh, a nice Thor hammer which we sell. It comes with a pair of white nylon faces which are like a medium um, hardness. It's got a, a, a yellow face which is uh, harder yet and a brown face which is softer again. Here's our fret wire. I've got three lengths of it. It's still got a little bit of curve in it. You can, we supply this already curved, but you can gently tease that out with your hands or I've made a little roller thing that will take the set out of it. But I like a little bit of curve, it tends to keep the fret ends down. I cannot recommend cutting your fret to length. I find it's a very, very fiddly process getting them in. Because what's going to happen, I don't know if you can see, the fret can the fret wire can roll just as you start putting it, it in. I'm going to put my first length in here. I'm just going to engage it in the slot. I can feel it's in. I've got a little bit sticking out there. And I'm going to work along a little bit. See, I'm tapping very lightly. Making sure it's seated along the full width. Once I feel that it's well seated, give it a few more vigorous. But I'm not really hammering it. If you hammer too hard, you'll punch it into the face of the timber. And then I'm going to come right up to the neck and cut that off. If you've got a good pair of cutters, it shouldn't do too much to that. But you can lift this if you're not careful and we just continue up the neck see I'm just putting it at a bit of an angle rolling it in so it's engaged just about a millimeter out from there gently tap the tang's going in and it's just getting in now I can fit so those little teeth on the tang that's the thin bit of the fret wire here's the thing don't if you move out here and start hammering, you'll bend the fret wire here and it can arch it back up. You want those dead ends down nice, but don't go hammering past here. And I hold my fret wire, cut off tight, tap it back in again. and repeat. I'm not going to do this every single fret, fret on camera so we'll just cut to where we got the whole lot. Okay we have all our frets in here. Now I've used about 75 centimeters of fret wire to do this. I had three lengths um, and they were about yeah 30 and a bit so it, uh, yeah it's maybe about 70 centimeters so um, you should have some left uh, left over we usually supply about 900 mil 90 centimeters of fret wire <coughs> with our kits and our necks this is Van Ghent Super Jumbo I quite like this because it's about 2.7 mil wide and I think it's 0.9 of a mil high that little bit of extra width I find it, it makes it nice and easy to get it seated flat. These should have gone in level, but here's something I do sometimes. Just to make sure everything's seated properly. Just go up and down with the block. At this point, you see our last fret is actually is, is on the neck proper and there's a little overhang. If you're putting frets in into an overhang, be very, very careful. Because what you need to do is to wedge under that tightly with some timber packers to make sure that would need to be packed up real tight to make sure you don't snap off the end of this fretboard. Believe me, it's easy to do because I have done it on a few occasions especially with this stuff, the Blackwood Tech, 
but you'll do it with pretty much any timber. If you, t if you don't support it and hammer frets in, you'll crack the fretboard. So, that's that. What we can do now is check it for straightness. We can check it with a long rule. We'll take this, these clamps out so we can get a rule across it. We can check it with a long rule, like so. And I'm pushing down, yeah, I'm going to one edge, to the middle, and there's no rocking. You can get a shorter rule and do the same sort of thing. I'm holding it down and seeing if I can... So that, generally speaking, is pretty level. And then this is what we can do. We can get one of these, a fret rocker. These are laser cut, so they're accurate and flat, straight, so that if there's a high spot, you'll see it with this. Because you can see, if you, you span this across three frets, and if there's a high point, you'll hear and feel it rocking. I'll continue going right the way up the neck, checking each three frets, across each three frets. You can see, and then I can, as we go up here, we might need to use the smallest edge, oops, like that, ah, I can feel that, I've just got one there, I think that's a tiny bit high in the middle, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the soft side of that. Gently tap that in because I think that maybe not was not a hundred percent seated. And then we continue the rest of them. A tiny bit of rock there, and there, and there. So this is this one. So I'm just going to. It's a firm hammer, but I'm not going mad because I said what I don't want to do is to punch the fret wire into the board. And with softer materials like Sapili <clears throat> or Walnut, you can punch the fret wire quite a long way in. So, that's it. We've put all our frets in. We've leveled them. The next step will be to trim these edges off. We'll do that in the next lesson. It's all uh, hand tools, taking it easy. Okay, so that was how to put frets into your neck. So remember, level the neck, check it for straightness, check to make sure it's not twisted, put the frets in. Uh, you see, you don't need that many tools. As you saw, we just used a soft-faced hammer a fret rocker, very useful for checking for high frets, and a good pair of side cutters. Okay, next step we'll be dressing these fret ends, getting them nice and smooth so the thing is really comfortable. What we've done today, we'll make sure that the guitar plays accurately and we'll be able to get a decent action. The next step, getting the fret ends down, is really important to make sure it's properly playable. Okay, see you next time.